Thank you, Tara, and good morning, everyone. My name is Marty Rabinovich, and I'm going to uh, continue the discussion today of uh, mental illness in the workplace with a uh, case law update. That's better. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start with a bit of an overview of my presentation. I've divided it into uh, five categories uh, for today. We'll start with uh, a case on uh, mental illness and absenteeism. We'll then get into uh, the connection between an incident leading to a dismissal and disability. We'll look at the duty of an employee who has a, a disability to provide a certain information about that to their employer. We'll look at dangerous employees, as in dangerous to their other coworkers, and whether in certain cases that could amount to an undue hardship or burden for an employer. And finally, in the accommodation process, we will look at the duty of an employer to consider alternate positions as an accommodation for an employee with a disability. So let's get uh, right into uh, mental illness and innocent absenteeism. And we'll look at uh, a decision called Schultz and uh, Lethbridge uh, Industries. It's a 2012 decision of the Human Rights Tribunal in Alberta. So in this case, uh, we had a middle-aged employee who had 25 years of service with the company, and he suffered from chronic depression as well as migraine headaches. He was regularly absent uh, due to uh, various uh, mental and uh, physical problems. He always had his manager's permission though, and he was never uh, given any discipline or formal warnings with respect to his absences. And the employer eventually decided to terminate his employment shortly after he returned to work following his seventh hernia surgery. So the Human Rights Tribunal ultimately found in favor of the employee. Uh, the tribunal found that the employer discriminated against uh, the employee uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, for dismissing him for absences when in the past the, uh, the employer had not raised uh, any issue with them, uh, likely because they were directly related to his disabilities. Uh, secondly, uh, the employer didn't uh, properly inquire into his health issues as they pertain to his absences. And as a quick side note, uh, the employer uh, is basically uh, entitled to uh, a prognosis, uh, not a diagnosis. So the employer is entitled to enough information to know what sort of accommodation would be required in the case of an employee with uh, a mental disability, but not necessarily the uh, diagnosis uh, itself. The employer was also found to have not uh, provided the employee a good enough opportunity to provide the necessary medical information that would have been needed to come up with uh, the proper accommodation and then just overall sort of failed with respect to the accommodation process. And as a result, the employee was awarded just over $80,000 for 30 months of lost wages, as well as $10,000 in general damages as a compensation for uh, pain and suffering uh, for, this, for the discrimination. So uh, certainly uh, there are some hefty financial consequences for an employer if uh, the accommodation process is not dealt with properly for an employee with uh, a mental disability. So another takeaway from this case, um, excess innocent absenteeism could be grounds for termination, even if the absence is a result of a disability. But before the employer is going to succeed on that, 
First of all, the employer would have to advise the employee of the seriousness of the absenteeism. The employer would need to be very careful to ensure that all of the relevant information is collected with respect to the absences. So is it because of an illness, is it because of a disability, or is it because of something unrelated? And third, and perhaps most importantly, the employer really needs to make sure that uh, that the, all possible avenues of accommodation are explored. And again, I can't stress this enough, the employer does have a duty to accommodate an employee with a disability, which of course includes mental disabilities, uh, up to the point of undue hardship. Okay, let's move along to uh, the connection between dismissal and a disability. And we'll look at a case called uh, Walton Enterprises and Lombardi. It's a uh, 2013 uh, Ontario decision of the uh, Divisional Court, which actually overturned uh, the uh, lower decision of our Human Rights Tribunal. So in this case, uh, the employee suffered from depression and hyperthyroidism. He was harassed at work due to perceived obesity, homosexuality, and depression, primarily through offensive comments made to him by his co-workers, as well as text messages. He reported this to his supervisor, supervisors, but, but uh, the supervisors in the Human Resources Department took no steps to, uh, to deal with this. Eventually, this employee is involved in a physical altercation with a co-worker after a disagreement over, uh, over the timing of certain repair jobs at work. The employee denies starting the fight and uh, told Human Resources that he felt as though he could not back down from the fight because he felt that if he did back down, it would have resulted in more teasing and harassment from his coworkers. So now the employer decides to investigate. The investigation conducted by the employer reveals that it was in fact him who threw the first punch. And mostly because of this, the uh, employer decides to terminate the employee's employment with cause. Ultimately, uh, the case makes its way up to the uh, divisional court. As a side note, the Human Rights Tribunal actually found in favor of the employee, but the divisional court overturned that decision, and we'll see why in just a second here. The divisional court found that um, even though the employee was harassed, uh, his dismissal did not amount to discrimination on the part of the employer. This was because there was insufficient evidence to connect the employee's behavior in starting this fist fight to the incidents of past harassment and to his depression. So basically, there was there was insufficient uh, evidence to uh, to link the uh, the fight to uh, any sort of disability. In fact, the court found that the employee's depression appeared uh, to have been controlled properly by medication, and the fight was unrelated. So from this case, we can see that. An employee who engages in misconduct that rises to the level of a crime um, cannot prove discrimination on the basis of disability if the disability played no part in the employer's decision to dismiss and if the employee suffered no greater impact for the misconduct than any other employee would have. Uh, that finding uh, comes from some cases out in British Columbia and Alberta. The Ontario case, case mentioned those findings and uh, seemed, to, seemed to be fine with them. So basically, if another employee, you know, without any sort of dis disability had started this fight, probably that would have amounted to just cause to terminate that employee. So that's essentially the reasoning that uh, the court relied on in this case. Let's move on now to the employee's duty to provide information to the employer with respect to the accommodation of uh, a mental health issue. And we'll look, uh, we'll look at a case here involving uh, the firefighters union out in, uh, in British Columbia. 
So in this case, uh, the employer demanded a whole bunch of medical documentation from the employee after the employee had been away due to a number of uh, physical issues. And as a result of these, uh, these document requests by the employer, this actually leads to the employee developing anxiety. Eventually, the employer is getting frustrated and uh, gives warnings and, and disciplines this employee for providing insufficient medical information. The employee finally says to the employer that uh, he had anxiety, still didn't provide a heck of a lot of medical information though, and the employee doesn't show up at, uh, at a medical assessment that had been uh, set up by the employer. So at the end of the day, basically what we take from this case is that uh, the employers are certainly entitled to, uh, to sufficient medical information about an employee with, uh, with a disability. Again, prognosis, not diagnosis. So certainly enough information to know um, what accommodation uh, would be required. Um, and for example, uh, the employer is entitled to medical information regarding any restrictions, so what the employee can do, and any duties that the employee would be able to carry out, so what they can do. Let's move along. We'll look at mental illness, violence, and undue hardship. We'll look at a case called Agroper and uh, Teamsters. It's a 2012 Ontario uh, labor arbitration decision. In this case, the employee had a traumatic childhood, had been sexually abused, and had a, a number of a severe uh, psychiatric disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, a whole bunch of other ones uh, as well, including a personality disorder, which was incurable. This employee missed over 100 days of work due to a personal crisis and regularly had homicidal thoughts. The employee was treated, but then when the employee returned to work, he became erratic, was eventually charged with assault, and uh, was incarcerated. The employer considered the situation, decided that uh, this employee was, was a little bit dangerous to have in the workplace uh, due to health and safety concerns for the other employees, and terminated this employee's employment. And uh, there was a fight about this, but the employer ultimately won. So basically, an employer is entitled to consistent medical evidence to suggest that an employee with a serious incurable psychiatric disorder, such as the employee in this case, poses little cause for concern. And because that evidence was not available in this case, in fact, the evidence seemed to suggest completely the opposite, that this employee was in fact uh, very uh, dangerous to have around. Um, the employer was successful. So in this case, uh, the arbitrator found that uh, reinstatement for the employee would not be appropriate, in particular because uh, the employee still uh, suffered from uh, occasional psychotic outbreaks, as he termed them, and the evidence basically suggested that uh, this employee was dangerous. So in this particular case, reinstating or continuing to employ this employee would have amounted to an undue burden or an undue hardship on the employer on the basis that it would have endangered other employees and uh, again the employer was successful and was not required to reinstate this employee. And finally, we'll get into the employer's duty to explore avenues of accommodation. This, uh, the next case is called Fear and Hamilton Wentworth. It's a 2012 decision of uh, our Human Rights Tribunal in Ontario. This employee worked as a supervisor uh, of regulated substances um, and she developed a generalized anxiety disorder which required hospitalization and later she was diagnosed with depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. And in this particular case, the, dis the disability, the mental disability seemed to have been brought on 
by the stressful nature of this position, in particular this employee's fear of making a mistake and uh, being held personally liable as a result. Uh, the, the employee uh, was away for a while uh, to deal with uh, some of these issues. The employer got impatient and decides to terminate her employment. Um, the tribunal ultimately found that, uh, that the employer had discriminated against the employee based on disability because uh, the employer had not properly gone through the accommodation process. So whereas the employee, the tribunal found generally was cooperative with the employer with respect to the accommodation process, the employer did not quite meet its duties. Um, there are a number of things listed here that the employer failed to do, for example, meeting with with, uh, the employee's vocational rehab consultant uh, to get a better sense of uh, the restrictions that were necessary um, and significantly as well, just jump right to the bottom, the employer didn't seem to be open enough to placing the employee in a more suitable position. So especially in this case, since there was evidence to suggest that it was the position itself that was causing the disability, uh, the tribunal found that the uh, employer ought to have been more open to the possibility of finding a comparable position, but that would have been a lot less stressful for this employee. So some things to uh, take away from all this. Employers have a duty to accommodate up to the point of undue hardship. This duty includes looking for more suitable positions for a mentally ill employee. The employees have a duty to cooperate with the employer in the accommodation process, which includes providing sufficient medical information for the employer to know what the, what the restrictions, if any, need to be. Um, so the employee can't just simply go to the doctor, get the doctor's support for a particular accommodation, and then demand and insist on that accommodation because that's what their doctor said. If the employer proposes an alternate accommodation that is perhaps less uh, of a burden for the employer, but that would all, but, but that accommodation would also meet the employee's needs, probably the employee has a legal obligation to accept that accommodation. Um, moving on, a disabled employee could be dismissed for innocent absenteeism in certain cases, but again, only if accommodating this would amount to an undue burden for the employer. Can't stress that one enough. Um, we saw from the case involving the, uh, the criminal offense, the assault, that an employee who is disabled who commits a crime can be dismissed for cause um, in cases where other employees who, who did the same thing would also have been treated in the same way. And then uh, again, dangerous uh, employees, again, such as uh, the one who committed the assault, can be uh, dismissed and probably this would be a situation which would amount to undue hardship. So that concludes my presentation for today. Um, if you remember anything else, I think we may have seen a variation of this slide before, but uh, there you have it, and uh, I think Larry's going to uh, briefly wrap things up. Thanks very much.